Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us on another uh, social emotional workshop. Today in our series, we're going to be talking about bullying and cyberbullying. And so Christina and Joe, take it away. Welcome back. Thanks so much. So we are jumping into cyberbullying and bullying today. And like we usually do, we're just going to spend a little bit of time defining stuff. stuff. Uh, so bullying is intentional and repetitive. And it is seeking to harm, intimidate, trick someone um, that the bully perceives as vulnerable. Cyberbullying is the exact same thing, but it's done in virtual platforms over the internet. It can be done through uh, texting, Facebook, uh, Twitter, all sorts of social media. Uh, so the platform really doesn't matter, but if it's a virtual communication, it's considered cyberbullying. The perpetrator is the bully. It's the person who is in causing harm. And for the purposes of this presentation, I'm really going to try to stick to the word target. But target and, uh, target and victim are the same thing. They're the person that is being harmed by the bully. Um, and the harm can be physical, emotional, embarrassment, all of those are forms of harm. And a bystander is a person who witnesses the event. They could be friends with the target, they could be friends with the bully, they could be just a random passerby, completely unrelated. But they're not engaging in um, either being the bully or they're not the direct target. So, you know, I'd love for you guys to kind of jump on and, and share if you've got any extra tidbits to add, but bullying and cyberbullying are very, very similar um, in that they're intentional and they're repetitive. And they intend to uh, pick someone that the bully perceives to be very vulnerable and intentionally try to cause them harm. Did anyone want to jump in and, and add anything that they might have in common? Yep, so cyberbullying can be over text. Uh, it quite often is over social media these days. It usually has some sort of uh, a written component where there are you know, various things being directed at the target that are intended to embarrass them, to call them out, to make them feel small, to make them feel uh, insignificant. And quite often it can also be done with pictures, videos, you know, clips, all sorts of things like that, uh, that maybe the Target did not want to be shared. There were personal photos and things like that. And more traditional bullying is typically verbal or physical um, in nature. And then sexual harassment is gonna fall under that as well. So this is a very, very small study out of a, a local Michigan high school. So just kind of the fact that it is very small, we have to be a little bit leery of the numbers, but looking at them for as they are, Bullying is definitely still well and alive in our in our schools. Um, you know, in 2019, when this happened, when the study was taken, 75 almost percent of kids admitted that they had been bullied in their lifetime. You know, at some point throughout their school lives. And then cyberbully across the lifetime, about 40 percent of kids said that they had been bullied across their lifespan, their school career. And uh, this is all self-reported, but many even admitted that they were themselves the bully um, and that they had bullied others across their school. Um, so that's kind of very interesting to see what folks are, are able to admit. And then another area that, that is a little bit alarming for us parents, right? You know, receiving sext and sending sexts. That's up there too. So cyberbullying is uh, against the law, and it might seem shocking that this didn't come about until 2019, um, but it has formally been added to uh, Michigan in March of 2019, and it, it is considered a misdemeanor. And the way that they track this is usually through uh, formally submitting complaints to the service provider. So formally complaining to Facebook, marking it in Twitter that it's offensive. Um, and then it's also tracked a lot by schools because schools will do some of their own investigation and can kind of find some of this information as well. Uh, 
but it it definitely is a misdemeanor You're going to be charged and even minors can end up serving some time or uh, needing to do community service as well. So how can we spot these actions? What exactly is cyberbullying particularly? Um, so rumor spreading, anything that's threatening, be it a text or, or a picture, a GIF can be threatening. Um, so it doesn't have to be words directly from the bully, but if they are intentionally sending them to someone else with the intent of hurting their feelings or causing them any type of harm, then it's going to be cyberbullying. Um, and of course, texts kind of fall into that. And it's kind of a gray area because a lot of times we think it's got to be, you know, over the internet or, or such. But texts are also included in that legislature. Um, emails and all sorts of things like that. And of course, any type of sexual harassment also falls into that because it makes the receiver feel very uncomfortable. And another big red flag that someone might be um, the perpetrator of cyberbullying is that they've got like multiple profiles that they go around pretending that there are other people on, um, or they keep one account that they let their parents see, and then they might have other accounts that only uh, peers see, and that can be a red flag. And indeed, even our targets, sometimes our victims might do this because Maybe they uh, feel like their their main profile has so much just hate messages on it that they'll delete it and make a new one. Um, so that's a red flag for e for anyone if you're noticing that. Um, quite often, teens will hide this, um, and I'd love if any of you are on the line to to speak to this. You know, how does it make you feel when you're receiving these? But quite often they will um, maybe take a hiatus from social media and they won't really quote it back to, you know, anything particularly for their health. They'll be really sketchy about uh, their reasons for taking the sabbatical from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, they'll just kind of stop using it abruptly because they're trying to escape uh, being targeted. They might appear really nervous um, and like hide their device or switch um, screens when a teacher or parent comes up behind them. Um, and they might just be like really frustrated um, or appear very sad when they're using the social media platform and even over games um, like Call of Duty games that allow you to talk back and forth. There can be uh, bullying happening there in the chat rooms as well. You might notice changes in their sleeping or eating habits. They might be withdrawing. Um, and this is true even of your peers. So teens can notice this in their friends as well. It's not just parents who can kind of observe these behaviors. All of us have the ability to uh, keep an eye on those we care about and notice these types of changes in folks' uh, habits. But it doesn't feel great uh, for sure. And this is a, a slide that I typically show in the teen presentation working with you guys because you got to know you've got a ton of power, even if you are a bystander on the internet where you're just kind of witnessing posts come up that you've been tagged in, um, or you're witnessing on someone else's thread that this is happening, you have a lot of power. And what you can do is you can flag the post as offensive. You know, no matter what site you're on, there's different ways that you can go flag it as offensive and take power that way. You can always let someone else know, uh, be it your own parent, the parent of the person uh, that is the target. You can let somebody know. Uh, you've got a lot of power as a bystander. So it's important, again, to kind of focus on what is within our control, what is within our grasp to really take action on. Uh, so if you're being targeted, you really can't change what that, what that bully is doing. Right, but you can change how you react to it. And lots of those coping skills that we talked about last week are gonna be helpful here. And of course, just reaching out for an adult. Um, I know that that quite often is called tattling or snitching, but it, it really is not because tattling and snitching, they have a different intent. The intent is to get the, the person in trouble. But reaching out for help, your intent is just to make the action stop. Uh, and that's kind of the distinction. So if you are protecting yourself, you're not tattling, you're reaching out for support. So that's kind of the distinction you wanna make there. 
Uh, this is a just a lovely way that you can kind of pause and think about your reaction to to the bully. And it, it looks like it's a long process because it's got five steps there, but you can do this very quickly in your mind. Uh, so pausing and doing some deep breathing. Maybe you want to pause and do some counting, whatever coping skill uh, works best for you. Take a second and do that. And that way you can kind of clear out that negative feeling within yourself. And you really just want to think about the situation that you're in. You know, is this a friend? Is this a one time thing where it's not even really bullying yet? They've just said one bad thing to me uh, that they intended to hurt me with. And really, you know, think about that and think about who all is involved and, and what exactly is going on. And then kind of do some risk benefit analysis. So, should I say something back firmly and assertively, which we'll talk about options on things you can say? Or should I just immediately leave the situation and weighing, you know, which one's going to give you the most benefit and get you out of that situation quickly? And then you just kind of prioritize which one is going to, to be better for me and select it and start taking action on it. And bystanders can use this exact same process because quite often when you come up on, especially if it's physical in-person bullying, it can be really hard to uh, stand up and say, hey, stop that but you can immediately turn around, head straight to the office and reach out for help. That is not tattling, that is reaching out for support. So whether you're the target or the bystander, you can follow this, this very simple process, uh, which is pause, reflect, think about the options, prioritize those options, and then select one to take action on. And that acronym is PROPS, might help you remember it a little bit better, but you'll have these slides if you wanted to, to look at that closer too. You do need to really um, look at this very objectively. And it is so hard when you're the target uh, to not feel like what they're saying might be true about you. Uh, but you really have to, to try to pull yourself out of it and, and look at it that the, the bully is intentionally and repetitively trying to harm me because of something going on with them. It is separate than anything going on with me. And this will help you um, use your coping skills and kind of cope with those really strong feelings. And it's very, very hard, but you're gonna wanna pick whichever one works best for you by practicing uh, breathing, meditating, music, cooking, exercise, any of these things that might make you feel better. And of course, seeking help if needed. So you, you matter and everything that they're saying is separate from you. It's something going on inside of them. You have no, uh, you did not elicit this response from them. You know, you do not deserve that for anything that they might be saying. And this is kind of a really, it's a hard one, whether you're a target or a bystander, but you want to shut down the situation as quickly as possible without really prompting much other emotion or back and forth from the bully. So you do wanna stand up and respectfully say, I'm not gonna let you talk to me like this. Um, I'm going to leave now. And just assert that this conversation is indeed over and you're not going to victimize me. But we wanna do that without getting a lot of back and forth, right? We don't want them to feed off of our distress from the situation, and it might actually make them come at us stronger and, and continue harassing us uh, when they see more emotional response from us. So one example I like to give is, you know, kids are real nervous when they're getting like tests back or, you know, they're getting texts from their parents and someone else sees it. So if a bully is saying, you know, you've got the strictest parents, you know, you can say, well, I'll let my parents worry about that. If they're saying that you, you're stupid, they've noticed you know four tests in a row, you've gotten a low, low grade back and you must be failing, I'm gonna let the teacher worry about that. And, and try not to give them any emotion that they can grab onto and keep harassing you with. And this is where it gets kind of tricky because in most other coping situations and uh, conflict rap, uh, resolution strategies, we would say to use I messages and to assert your feelings and, and try to come to win-win agreements. But when you're working with someone, um, when you're dealing with someone who is a bully and is intentionally doing this to cause you harm, 
you don't want to let them know you're feeling maybe. Uh, you don't want to give them any feeling word that they could grab onto and then keep calling you a sissy or a wussy uh, because you're upset and they'll, they could turn your own words back on you and use them to harm you. So you do want to avoid doing that when you're in uh, bullying situations. Now, it's the complete opposite if it's like the first time someone's offending you. It's the first time that it's happened. You might want to start with a conflict resolution strategy like a strong I message and see if you can repair that. But when it's ongoing bullying, when it's happened more than once, and this person is out to harm you, you don't want to feed into that by uh, giving them any emotional response from you. And that is very difficult, even for bystanders, right? But one thing I really recommend to, uh, to all of my teens and even, even us adults, right, to go through and take stock of, of what you're sending out into the world. And, you know, what are you sharing? And I invite you to just look at the top 100 things that you've shared recently, just the first 100. And look at how many times have you been critical of yourself or others? You know, how many times have you taken someone down with words or with gifts, right? Is there something you wouldn't want your school to see? Is there something you wouldn't want your parent to see or a future employer to see? And tally that up and kind of take stock of what's going in, uh, what's going on in your social media life. And then you can work forward from there. You might find that, you know, you've been targeted more than you thought. And then you can help document that and help the school support you more through that documentation. You might find that you've been really judgmental and you might be the bully in that situation. And you can take steps to recover from that. So I think this is just so great for all of us um, because we do spend an awful lot of time on our phones and on our computers out there in the web. So it's really important for us to take stock of what we're doing out there. Uh, what can we do to shut this down? So definitely do some decision making and, and use props. Figure out if it is best to escape the situation or be assertive if you're the bystander intervene. And then we can do this again with um, online cyberbullying. So use props when you're about to post something. When you're looking at, you know, should I post this really funny GIF? You know, will this hurt anybody's feelings? Am I intentionally targeting it towards a certain person that I'm tagging in this photo? Or am I just kind of sharing my opinion out to the world? And, and prioritize that, right? So look at the options well. It's post or not post. And which one will be the kindest message I can send out and choose that. Again, even bystanders can do this. So use that props when you're thinking, should I report this? You know, is this hurting someone? Could this cause harm to someone? And, and definitely if it's going to cause harm to someone, you should probably be flagging it and reporting it. Um, so when we're thinking about props, we really wanna put, to, put our values in perspective. So it's not just, will this hurt someone? Um, no, so it's safe to post. You know, it's, it's a lot more about, does this say um, my values? What will people think my values are when they see me posting this? And ask yourself that, does it align with what I value in life? Uh, kindness, compassion, education, you know, whatever your values are, look at them in context to everything that you post out there on the, on the world because you can't get it back. Um, even if you delete it, even if you flag it, that stuff really still is out there um, and can be looked at not just by uh, the platforms themselves, but law enforcement can get involved and they can request things that have even been taken down. So it's really important to think before you post. And I would do the entire props decision-making, you know, who, who is my target audience for this? Will it hurt them? Does it reflect my values? And then whether you're in person or you're online, you do wanna have some very calm back pocket responses. So quick things you can say that are assertive and can shut down the situation, but that doesn't really give the bully any more information about your state of mind or your feelings that they could attack further. Very calm, quick responses to shut it down. Use blocking for sure. 
you can even take little breaks from people from now. Like you don't have to formally block them. You can go take a two week break or a one month break and then reassess the situation at the end. We do however wanna refrain from blocking others in order to manipulate them. Um, because at that point you're becoming a bully as well. You're, you're intentionally trying to change their mind or to harm them with your block to get something that you want. Um, so blocking really needs to be used for protecting yourself and not for causing harm to someone else, because then you're you're just joining the, the crowd. You're becoming part of the bullying problem. With uh, flagging things is inappropriate as well. So if it's obviously not appropriate and you're continuously flagging it uh, just to try to get the person in trouble, it's not a great idea. We don't want to be doing that. You know, so this is labeled as a parent, but really all of us can, can have a say in this. So if we're noticing th this type of um, scenario play out, um, we're just a bystander, we're also in the same chat group and we're watching this conversation unfold, immediately talk to the target, assess how they're feeling, assess if they need your support in reaching out for help. Um, of course, if you are the parent or a teacher, you can set safety rules. It might be screen time limits. It might be who they're allowed to friend and unfriend um, and other types of other regulations that you can enforce inside the house. But you definitely want to talk uh, about their habits. You can go through the, the tally check mark with them and you can do this even if you're not a parent, right? If you are just a friend, be like, hey, let's look at your social media use. Let's do it together. And, and let's see, maybe we should both take a stand and, and take a break from social media, or maybe we should both unfriend that person and report them to the principal's office. You know, So even if you're not a parent, but you're watching this unfold and you're just a bystander, you can take some action and help that person. Uh, you definitely wanna document it in any way and don't just rely on Facebook's you know, tracking of your blocked stuff or you know, whatever documentation the school or police are doing. Kind of on your own, keep a little sheet going, you know, these days they said this to me. And write down exactly what they said in the quotations. This is the action I took. I reported it on Facebook. I told my mom, we called the school principal together. Write that down, all the dates and stuff. And this will help you assess um, whether or not it is bullying because it's gotta be repetitive to be bullying and to be able to take action. It's gotta happen more than once. So you need a log of that. Um, it can help determine the severity of it. And, you know, a lot of schools do really, really great work in documenting this, but maybe your school doesn't and you wanna have your own log, something that's just for you. So it's important to kind of uh, just keep your own log of all of this type, type of information. Um, working with technology providers. So once you flag it, if they're really bullying you, and this is happening often, don't stop there. Reach out to tech support. Did you get my block? Did you get my flag? What action's being taken? And keep, keep that communication open. Um, anything that there's a threat of assault or injury or something that is illegal, above contacting, you know, you wanna tell your parent, you wanna tell the school, report it on Facebook. Also call the police. We have to report this to the police if there's a threat of assault, injury, um, or anything like that. We have to take those threats very seriously. You know, other types of um, threats that are not assault or bodily injury, you wanna do your, your props decision-making process on it, right? You know, how serious is this? Is it just tell mom? Is it just block it? Is it tell mom, tell the school? Um, and it, invite your, your team to be part of this decision-making process. We don't wanna um, run out and just start reporting it and taking over the situation. We wanna empower them to, to reach out for help their own way and let them do that props decision-making. Maybe it doesn't bother them that much. Maybe they truly don't wanna take it further. They just wanna block the person and call it a day and allow them to be part of that uh, process. And again, we don't have to be a parent to validate and empathize with folks. You know, just listen to how they describe the situation um, and how they felt after the situation. Maybe it was resolved um, and you can figure out how they resolved it and how they feel about that resolution. Of course, if you're a parent, this is a, it's very serious. Uh, you do want to 
immediately talk with your teen about what's happening to them and validate and empathize um, and let them know that they matter. And then developing other uh, healthy bonds and, and um, connections can also someone recover. Uh, sometimes a teen could get ostracized from you know, their main friend circle and the bully is, is one of their ex-best friends and they might not have a lot of other relationships outside of that. So we, we wanna help them build new relationships and new friendships to support them. Um, you know, talking about that load, uh, locus of control and back pocket responses and kind of helping them figure out how they're going to respond if this happens. And you can do this uh, even before anything even happens. So just like with refusal skills for, you know, drugs and alcohol, same thing, practice. You know, if you walk by someone being bullied, what are you going to say? And allow them to practice what they might say. If someone is targeting you and harassing you repeatedly, how are you going to shut that down? What action are you going to take? And let them practice that skill uh, with you in like a role play situation. Uh, definitely reach out for help. Um, if this is repeated, quite often the school will offer some referrals. Um, but if they don't, you want to reach out and say, hey, you know, let's, let's talk to a professional. Let's get some counseling around this. And then teaching. Quite often our teens uh, know much more about some of these platforms than we do, but teaching them how to block and you know set up their profiles so that they're private, it's really important. And you know, sometimes parents need that too. So if you have the knowledge, share it with everyone you know. If you know how to work that social media platform and you're finding that you know some of your friends are posting things very publicly and you know that they would not want to, you know. Go ask them, did you mean to set that as private? Do you want me to show you how to mark that as friends only um, or send it directly to certain people? So if you've got the knowledge, teach others how to, to use the platform. And then, you know, sometimes we ourselves might end up being the bully and it wasn't our intention and we need to correct ourselves. Or sometimes you find that your child is the bully and you wanna figure out what's going on there. So a lot of the same signs, right? So switching off of their device quickly or just switching windows really quickly when someone walks behind them, um, staying up all night or hiding in the bathroom to use their device, um, getting really upset if someone is touching their device or if it's been taken away from them and they're really, really anxious. You know, this could be a sign of just withdrawal from technology, but it could also be a sign that something, a conversation that was really rough was happening and it was, was not finished. Uh, so they could be indeed the, the target or the bully themselves. And, and they're acting really upset that they didn't get to finish that conversation or engagement. Um, you know, they might be like laughing a lot and then not wanting to share what's so funny because they're laughing at someone else's expense and they know that you wouldn't laugh with. Right, so just kind of avoiding what they're, what they're doing. They don't want to talk about what they're doing. Uh, they might be laughing a lot and they don't want to share what's so funny. And then of course that multiple accounts, right? And this is a big red flag for either the target or the bully. If they've got multiple accounts, something fishy might be going on. You definitely want to look into that. Um, just increased issues. Uh, so. A lot of times if someone is starting to fall down this path, it's happening both in school and online. Um, so if there's any type of disciplinary or, or in-person bullying happening, there's probably some cyberbullying happening too um, because it, it does feel a little safer, right? Than, than to go pick on someone live or they might be able to pick on you back. It's totally different when you can do it anonymously online. Uh, so quite often if, if they are bullying in person, can bet they're probably bullying uh, cyberly as well. They might be really, really concerned with their popularity. Um, and of course, that's just part of growing up, right? <laughs> but it could be a sign that something more serious is going on. Uh, maybe they're, they're becoming, they're losing a lot of that empathy and you notice they're becoming really apathetic about what other people uh, feel that could be a red flag for multiple things. Um, anytime that the school is requesting um, 
you know, your student go, go to go home a lot, it could be a legitimate medical concern um, or it could be a mental health concern. And being the target of bullying or being a bully themselves could definitely elicit that, um, some mental health issues going on with their bullying school. They, they might also think that, you know, they're really, really awesome on social media and they're kind of showing you not only do they have multiple accounts, but maybe they're actively telling you how they manipulate systems and get around different things. And that can be a red flag. Because uh, why do you need to get around some of those loopholes? Um, so obviously for, for us as bystanders, and especially for parents and teachers, we always want to rush in and help the target first. First things first, get that target safe. Um, but once that is done, we want to loop back around and figure out what is going on that's making the bully do this. And can we help them uh, recover from being a bully? So we want to find out, you know, are they joining in because someone else started it and they felt a lot of peer pressure to also join in and make comments, especially online. We'll see that a lot uh, with cyberbullying where one person kind of starts it and then 50 more messages come in from everybody else like agreeing with it. So we want to kind of find out what's happening there. Um, and we've all heard, you know, hurt people hurt people. So were they the target of a bully last year and now they're kind of repeating that to someone else? Or are they, um, are they targeting their previous bully and it's like a retaliation thing going on? You want to get to the heart of that. You know, so just kind of talking with them about what is your intention here? Uh, why are you doing this? And bullying behavior can absolutely change. Uh, a lot of bullies can recover and become kind-hearted people. Quite often, you know, it is about a lack of empathy or feeling like they have been victimized and they need to lash back out. So figuring out, you know, what's at the base of, what is their reason for that behavior? Um, and, and working on restorative justice. So these are great because they help both the target and the bully come to like a win-win where justice can be restored and we can move on from this issue. Um, and it's just, it's very healing for both parties in many cases. Um, yep, so it does take a lot of time. So whether you're a parent or a teacher working on this, we have to very consistently uh, set boundaries and have the exact same um, consequence happen when these rules are broken so that we can help them recover. And it does take some time. You know, if you're in a pattern of talking really sarcastically and rudely to others, it's hard to break that, even when your intentions are not to harm. And here's a ton of different websites like I usually keep for you guys. So, you know, if you are, whether you're a teen, a parent, or a teacher, there's a website on here that, that'll be great for you. All right, so this one's best for parents. And this one I'd say is probably, these two here are really great for educators. And then this one has kind of full circle where teens, um, parents, and educators might find this one really helpful. And then of course, you know, all the, the same phone numbers I normally put out there. So Joe, you want to jump in and add anything? Yes, I kind of, uh, when you were talking about some things, I made some notes and um, I like what you're talking about, about the tattling and snitching. Although um, I've heard some, a different phrase, um, the difference between telling and tattling. Yeah. You know, telling is keeping somebody safe and tattling is na 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 na. I want to get you in trouble. Right, teacher, teacher, he did this, you know, you wanted to get them in trouble. So, but to explain to that youth that telling is really important that, hey, teacher, I saw somebody writing some really inappropriate things on the wall, or I saw somebody taking somebody's stuff. That's telling to protect somebody. So I kind of like that. And I just thought those other words, the telling and tattling is the thing. The telling is really something good, and the tattling is getting in trouble. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Joe. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, um, one other thing um, that brought up, you mentioned the one time, 
you know, uh, that bullying is kind of repetitive. And I was in one presentation where they were saying that even if it's a one-time thing, it could be bullying behavior, mm -hmm. but they only bullied you one time. So you kind of, you're not getting bullied anymore. But if it was hurtful and it was, um, you know, disrespectful or aggressive or um, inappropriate to even tell because they might've did you one time, then they bully somebody else one time, then they bully somebody else one time, they're not really repetitively doing the same person. Yeah, so. yeah, very strategically. So that's where you you definitely wanna try to, to talk it through and, and go ahead and use the I messages in this case. Uh, but we still want to report it and, and let someone know that this has happened because like you said there could be a pattern it could be a month later and they start bullying you again or it could be a pattern where they're picking a new victim every week um and and they know that if it happens more than twice someone's going to tell but maybe i could go pick a new person every time and i'm not going to get in trouble because no one's going to tell if it always happens once uh so this is where you wanna to try to use the conflict resolution skills and see if you can restore that relationship, but also still document it and let your teacher or your parent know that it happened. Sometimes, Christina, um, how you doing? Um, sometimes it's, it's happening at home, the child is getting bullied at home. So they're coming to the school or going somewhere like to a rec center library and they're doing to that person what they're getting at home. So that, cause, in some ways, it probably it makes see how other person feel the way they be feeling when they're at home. Because sometimes bullying, is, they do get bullied at home. Where I had a situation where um, the student, the student was getting bullied at home by the step, the step, the step brother. He was older. Mom married the dad, and getting and he they were coming to the school and do it to the kids younger than him, so he can get you know feel like his step brother. So power. yes. That point. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so sometimes it, it, it's, it's at home as well. For sure. And that's where we really, as adults, we have to look at that bully as just another child who needs help. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we have to first protect the, the target so that they're not in danger uh, immediately. But we also need to circle back and see is my bully in danger? Are they um, just repeating what's being done to them somewhere else? And, and can we come to restorative justice for all parties um, where it's a win-win and, and everyone is resolving the conflict and, and growing from it um, rather than being in trouble. And you know, certain people are in trouble and, and that's kind of where the tattling comes in because they know, you know us adults are gonna respond a certain way and they might be, like I said, retaliating and, and even blocking can become that where they're bullying each other back. And, you know, I blocked you so, um, so that it would hurt you, so that you would know that their relationship has been severed and you're all alone. Um, and we have to avoid those cycles of retaliation by restorative justice. And actually some people, some people, adults, you know, we, sometimes we don't just figure it out because some, some will say, well, you're not, Get, first of all, you'll say you're getting bullied. You're not getting bullied. They're just playing too rough. Or they just playing and just let it go and brush it off and it keep on happening. So then sometimes they get afraid, be afraid to say anything because they feel that they're going to say, we're going to say, oh, you're just crying wolf. Yeah. Because, you know, some, of, some adults look at it like, you know, he's just playing too rough with you. It's not bullying. And, you know, stop acting like, a, stop crying and whining. You know, they're just playing. So sure. that's that's another thing you have to look at too because if we feel like, if we tell them they're crying wolf, then, you know, there's nothing going to be done about it. It's going to be continued. Thank you so much, Leslie. And that kind of brings back keeping your own track. And that's why you keep your own log because you could have gone and told a teacher and they did nothing about it. Um, but if you've got that written down that I did tell this person on this day and they told me they were going to reach out to the principal, you know, keeping that log can really help you if it escalates that far. That, yes, I did try reaching out for help. And, and not only did it not help me, it maybe set me back and made problems worse uh, because that adult validated the bully's behavior instead of helping me. And that's why keeping your own log is so important.
I know you guys see this. I don't see any teens in here today, uh, but I know you educators, you see it a lot. Anyone else wanna reach in and add some more stuff? Add to the conversation? I'd like to add something. And it is a lot like Christina said that uh, hurt people hurt people. And like what Leslie just shared that, you know, the bully is being bullied either by the parents or the siblings, and they just go to the next lower hierarchy on the, uh, the food chain. And they bully them because they're hurt. Although they have done some research and they, we always thought that the bully was hurt. And they've done research that's a lot of times, I don't know the percentage, but um, a lot of times the bully isn't hurt. They're arrogant. They have such self-esteem, unhealthy, high self-esteem, and they never really suffered any consequences, like maybe from permissive parenting and never facing any of the consequences from their behavior. And it's kind of like a lack of empathy where I don't care how I treat somebody. I'm going to do what makes me feel good. And I don't really care on how that other person reacts to it. Mm -hmm. And if they have a negative reaction, I even feel more powerful and arrogant and in command and control. So it's not always the hurt person. Sometimes it's just that person who lacks the empathy and doesn't have a good um, structure at home with consequences and talking and uh, um, having responsibility for their behavior. Yeah, yeah, they might not necessarily be abused or neglected in that they're hurting so profoundly, but they haven't been taught empathy skills and active listening skills, and they just don't have these healthy uh, communication skills. And that's a hurt all on its own that we don't even, we're not aware of. Because if we don't know that we should be responding to others with empathy, we don't realize there's anything wrong with our communication. Mm -hmm. And then if we're validated, like what Leslie said, by an adult saying, oh, they're just being a little rough. Boys will be boys and things mm -hmm. like that. They get even more power from that and they feel more confident in their actions over time. You bring, up, you bring up something important in terms of empathy being a learned skill. It's, it's not something that kids pick up along the way if it isn't intentionally taught. You know, um, and, you know, the other thing I'd like to comment on is the fact that, you know, we intellectually verbalize these virtues and stuff in, 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 uh, that are high value in our society. But in everyday parlance or in everyday experience, do we really value them? We, we, we've, you know, a lot of times I look around and I, I, I see people value in dominance. You know, you see it in sports metaphors, you see it in politics, you know, somehow this dominance is a strength that's to be valued and you know kids pick up on that because i'm sure they've had experiences where it's not about what what do what people say you do you you know how, how does it go you don't do what you say they do what you do exactly so, yeah so they you're attempting, you're attempting to dominate me yeah you know? and so yeah. It, it translates and you know, we have competing messages i guess is what i'm saying Oh, and for so, sure. So the kids bring that to school and says, you know what? You know, I'm 16, I'm a man, you know, and men dominate. Yep. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure it's, it's another dynamic for women, you know? <laughs> oh, I think, I think it's so similar for men and women and we just don't realize it. It's about feeling that power and it's about feeling like we are the bigger, better person in, in yeah. that case. I don't think men and women are really that different on the... Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, the that, gender, roles, you know, gender roles are colliding these days anyway, yeah. you know. Yeah, I kind of like what Alan said about the, the modeling. If the kids don't learn it, you know, where are they going to learn empathy if the, if the parents don't model it? Mm -hmm. And usually the parents try to jam it down their throat or if they want to teach a, a, a attribute like respect. The parent will say, you better respect me. You hear me? And there's no respect in that modeling. All it is is right. um, this power that I'm going to tell you to respect me disrespectfully or spanking, right? Right. Oh, yeah. Or oh my brother. Gosh. So I'm teaching them not to hit while I'm hitting. Yeah. And those lessons aren't learned because it's like conflicting. It's like, wait, they're yep. telling me not to do it, but they're doing it. So what is and right? They're going to absorb the action over the words, just like what Alan was saying. Sometimes it's not even in the home. It's it might be happening at school where. 
we've got posters all over the wall about a growth mindset, but then we're being drilled and, and taught something different than the poster by the actions that the adults around us are doing. So I, I just really love that point that you made, Alan. You know, we're talking about it and, and saying it's important to us, but do our actions show that it's important? Right. Let's pull back up the chat. Yeah, Michelle just wrote that um, spanking kind of creates more violent behavior. Oh, for sure. From learned. Yeah, there is a lot of research on corporal punishment on how that affects that child's uh, growth and development. Yeah, I have. I think yelling, yelling, and screaming at a child that does that that's not good either, because then you you they become afraid of the loud talk and yelling when, you know, it's, if you could just talk to them, maybe they understand, but if they hear yelling all day, every day, that's what they're going to portray. They don't go to school and yell. You know, even if you say, good morning, Sam, they'll yell, good morning. You know, so if they used to something and they see it every day, all day, then that's what they're going to portray that's the, until they learn something different. Yeah. Something and then they're different. afraid to go to the parent if they are the victim too because my parents just gonna yell at me and blame me. Tell me to stand up for myself and don't yes. take, you right. go punch them in the nose. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so from a parent perspective, um, when your child is being bullied, as long, you know, you have to kind of look at the level of risk because if it's peer talking to peer, kind of teasing and stuff, and it's not that stuff that is um, um, dangerous and, and hurtful and, uh, illegal with the sexting or if it's peer teasing peer a parent is better to support that child by um, saying that must be really hard when you're being teased by your your classmates empathize with that that's really frustrating man I, I, I can't imagine you know what you're going through instead of solving that problem if you go straight to problem solving and you solve that bullying problem for that that child you're taking away his ability for his own self-esteem, his own problem-solving skills. So you need to kind of slow down as parents and work with and walk your child through those feelings and help them process those feelings and then empower them by asking the questions. So what do you think you can do next time this happens? Instead of giving them 10 things to do. All right, next time this happens, do A, B, and C. Yeah, Instead ask of, them, <laughs> what would yeah. you like to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I like to punch him in the mouth. So that would be one response from the child. And, and then, then for process the it, right? You know, well, what will happen? Go ahead, play it. What will happen if we punch him in the mouth? What, what will be the consequences of that? Instead of saying, don't punch him in the mouth, do what uh, Christina's props to um, um, observe or evaluate that. Okay, you could punch him in the mouth. That's one option. What would happen then? Well, I'd probably get <laughs> suspended from school. Mm -hmm. and might get in a fight or he might get angry and bring a gun next time whatever it is so yeah that could happen so what else can you do so keep empowering that child to um, uh, come up with ideas and confidence to deal with that that challenge yeah the question you can ask is like okay when you a student uh child is talking to the parent about being bullied the parents should sit down and say okay well first off how did how did that make you feel how do it make you feel Tell them how it make you feel. So then maybe you can, okay, when you go to school tomorrow, if it, if it happens again, tell them how that makes you feel. I do, I do not like when you push me or bully me. It makes me feel sad or whatever. Just ask them, how do it make you feel? And I think with that approach, it can, you know, get back down to a level, level where it'll stop. You know, just like give them the option to, like you say, take it actually in their own hands. Like, I, I don't like you doing that. That's not nice. It makes me feel a certain type of way. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I just remembered a personal experience. I used to teach in the projects in Gary, Indiana, and you know, kids travel with their cohort. You know, they start from first grade in these communities, and they wind up in seventh and eighth grade, even through high school. <clears throat> Same people, right? And this one particular kid had been bullied by this young man since he was pro probably first grade. And one day, I, I taught seventh grade at the time. One day, this kid brought his father's gun to school and shot him wow you know the cumulative effects of that abuse i mean it's not to be discounted you know, mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know be, before all these mass shootings used to used to hear that from time to time this kid brings a gun to school and stuff like that 
Mm -hmm. yeah, all those unprocessed feelings, you know, they don't have that support system. They don't, they can't go through their parents maybe because of what Christina was talking mm -hmm. about. Parents saying, oh, come on, get over it kind of stuff. Right. So that's all unprocessed um, pain that they feel no way out except by those yeah. um, totally aggressive and detrimental yeah. outcomes. So if we, if we're finding that that's happening in our home teens, reach out to a different adult and keep it in your log. You know, I talked to mom this day and she told me to buck it up, she told me to man up. I talked to my counselor this day, he told me to man up. And don't stop reaching out for help at that point. It is not your fault um, that your parent or the teacher that you went to didn't take action. And it's not a sign to stop reaching out for help. Continue to reach out for help in other avenues. Uh, and I think your school is probably, should be your number one spot. You know, reach out directly to your teacher. If nothing happens, reach out directly to your counselor. And don't let more than a day or two pass in between this. Like, don't let it keep going on and on. Like, and just keep a log every month that you're reaching out. Immediately, you should expect action from that adult. They are responsible to you to take action. So don't let time pass. You know, two days. What, what's happening? Is there a restorative justice meeting? Let's get to it. Um, if there's not, you know, keep, keep reaching out to a new person. You know, take it one more higher up on the chain, get to the counselor, get to the principal and keep asking for help. Don't give up. Um, Leslie, I wanna address something that, or add to something that you said and telling that, um, that bully that, you know, that hurts my feelings and stuff. I mean, that is okay and stuff, mm -hmm. but I was that, I was at a bully presentation at the Macomb Intermediate School District and this um, student safety consultant that works there, we were talking about what kids can do. And somebody mentioned the I message. You know, I feel hurt when you say that because it's, it's uh, disrespectful. Mm -hmm. And she's saying that that's not the most effective approach because some of the bullies, that's what they want. They want that emotional pain. So when the child says that hurts my feelings, the bully will say, hey, hey, sissy, see, and they, they get power from that. So the first thing that you said was, I don't like when you do that. I want you to stop. That's just being assertive and saying, yeah. make it stop. Because that's the first thing, like I teach sexual harassment in the workplace. And the first thing, if it went to litigation, would say, did you tell them to stop? So if a child is being bullied, to teach them that assertiveness, just to say, I don't like that, I want you to stop. And they can turn around and walk away because they directly assertively said, stop. Not because you're hurting my feelings or making me sad, because that just gives the bully some power, if that makes sense. I got you, yeah. For sure. Thanks. It Again, you know, is this the first time? If it's the very first time you've ever heard of this person being rude to anyone, Maybe try conflict resolution, give them a strong I message, and they might respond with empathy like, oh man, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. And then they might even tell you a bad thing that happened to them that day, like, oh, I'm just in a bad mood because, and then the relationship can continue on. But if it's happened more than once, whether or not it's to you, like if you've seen this kid in the hallway treating someone else like poop, and then they come and treat you like poop, don't feed in and tell them how emotional you are. It just be assertive and say, I need it to stop. And then report it. Awesome. I want to give one really good response that I hear. I watched this YouTube video about the one phrase that stops anything that somebody says about you. It's, why would you say that? Oh, you're an idiot. You're a loser. Why would you say that? Mm -hmm. And they got to think about evidence. <laughs> why, why is the eternal question? It can always be asked. Yeah. So what do you mean by that? When you call me a baby or a sissy or whatever it is, what do you mean by that? Why would you say that? And the, it, it almost stumps that uh, the bully up like, what, because I want to hurt your feelings? And, <laughs> you know, why do they say that? And they would have to kind of, wow, I don't know why I said that. I guess it was just to hurt him. Yeah. It's just a quick phrase that um, is really useful for adults or children. Oh, yes. That's what I was just about to say, Joe. I mean, even as adults, this happens to us sometimes. And, and saying something like that could be enough to make someone realize that they were being a jerk. 
and that they need to recover that to continue being your friend and to continue interacting with you at all. So it might turn it around. Just ask them why. And immediately they could respond with, you know, something that lets you know how bad their day was going and what kind of caused that. One of the things that I'm seeing now, um, these children who are being bullied, a lot of times they've allowed this to happen for so long. Um, they've held their feelings back and now they are sent to anger management courses. Whereas the person who was actually doing the bullying, nothing ever happened to them. So now they feel like I'm the victim, I'm being punished. And now you're taking me through a course of action. Whereas nothing was done to the other child, especially as these teens, uh, 17, 18, 19, because you know, now the legal system is coming in and it's almost as though no one addressed this all these years. Like it, it can be a step parent or something was going on, like she said, in the home. And now that they decide to be assertive, it came out in the wrong way. Now the legal system is stepping in and telling them you have anger management issues when really they've been bullied and misused and mistreated all these years. Yeah, and that accumulation is, it's so hard, it's so hard. Thank you for that, Susan, so hard. So that is again, why keeping a log will really help you. Uh, and then you can kind of show that you have been coping with this for a very long time and it could help you uh, at the school you know, policy si system and then at the legal system as well um, in, in proving that you've been taking calm action for many years and nothing has happened. Um, and that just kind of speaks to reporting it as soon as you can, because you don't know, you know, maybe you're coping really well right now and you're like, no, I'm good, I got this. Six months later, you could not be coping that well after all the accumulation of, of it is adding on you and wearing on you and you could end up lashing back out. So you wanna definitely report it as soon as possible um, before it gets to that point. I know as an educator, when I was in the classroom, I would constantly take the temperature of the room to see and gauge where everything was going and what direction things were going in. Because, you know, as you're conducting your class, you hear conversations and you hear things going on. And so I would advocate for uh, the students, not in a way where they were called out and made to feel, you know, like, oh my God, I'm being exposed. When I would hear conversations taking place, I would address it class-wise. That way, those that were being victimized could develop the confidence from the conversation being put out to all of them as opposing to, um, and, even, and even in the case of the bully themselves, because when you single out a bully, you know, the objective hopefully is that they stop, but you, you also have to be mindful because that's a fine line. You can further traumatize them. Absolutely. You know? And so you, you have to take the temperature of your class and your students and be mindful and address it as a whole so that they don't feel like, you know, I'm telling or I'm snitching or um, I'm being made an example of. You, you, you give that bully the opportunity to come to a realization and correct the behavior as well as the victim. To be empowered. Yeah, yes. that's really awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing everyone. Uh, and, and teens who are watching, you know, these guys are your advocates. You now know who you can go to, right? You see which teachers are speaking out on your half and that's the one you want to go to, right? So you've got a lot of folks in your corner. Speak it out. We do not want to embarrass you further. We do not want to call you out more. We want to help you through it and we want to help you through it before it gets to the point where it's criminal justice system. Absolutely. 
thanks so much for sharing all of your experience and awesome discussion time today. I think we are totally out of time now and I owe you time from last week. So <laughs> have, have a lovely uh, week and I will see you guys Thursday. We'll be talking about suicide prevention. Thanks everybody for joining. Christina, Christina, how many more are there? How many more sessions are there? We're going through March. Yeah, March 4th. March 4th. Sorry. All right, I don't know why I had today's written down as the last one. So I was just curious. All right. I don't I don't know why. I thought there was only this was the last one, but that's fine. Now I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Yep, we're here till March 4th. And I have to say, I don't know if you've ever watched the show, What Would You Do? Have you ever watched that? It's no. a great show. So they set up scenarios and they have actors. And I remember one where this kid was being basically bullied because he had red hair and they were calling him a ginger. And they were in a, um, in a restaurant setting and they set it up to see what people will do and how they will defend. Yeah. And now most of the time it's adults defending, it's not kids, but at least kids can see how other people can stand up for someone else. But it's a great show. It really is. Bystander power is, is phenomenal. Um, yeah. and, and the bystander can have, why would you say that to someone? Yeah. It doesn't always have to be the target doing that. And then it kind of dawns on the bully that they've been caught, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that I mean, this if is they not have an isolation. They have great scenarios. They had one where a lady was pretending to be blind and she was being um, taken for her money at the cash register because of course she can't feel you know, so it, they have all these different scenarios and it's fascinating to watch how some people completely ignore and walk away and some people get involved. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It also points out like that group conformity type of theory as well, that yeah. we'll go along with it, even if we don't understand why, just because we're seeing others. Yeah. And, and that's just, that's awesome. Thank you. What would you do? I like that show, Shirley. Yeah, it's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. I enjoy watching it. Did you see the one where they put the um, pill in the lady's drink when she went to the bathroom? Oh, I don't think I saw that one. No. Yeah, oh. they were at a bar and these, uh, this guy put a pill in the lady's drink and, you know, the people saw. And then when the lady comes back, it's who's going to tell her? And did, uh, and did people tell? Uh, some did, some didn't. Wow. Wow, that's fascinating. Can you imagine yeah. not telling on that? You just saw a gentleman put a pill in this lady's drink when she went to the bathroom and you're not going to protect that lady? From yes. Drinking? Yes. That was scary one. Unfortunately, I have a big mouth. I would totally say something. <laughs> well, that's, that's fortunate for her at least, right? It's a props decision-making, you know, what will happen if I don't tell? Yeah. Those are, good scenario. Those are really good scenarios um, that you can utilize uh, with your, your students in the classroom for discussions, mm -hmm. you know, to help empower and further um, encourage those students to be more outspoken and um, not tolerate uh, poor behavior from anybody. Right, right, absolutely. And, and you know, even if you can find a snippet on YouTube and just show them how sure. people do stand up for other people, you know, this does happen. You know, these people didn't realize it was a pretend situation. They thought it was real and they're doing the right thing. Yeah, yep. so you're not alone. You know, it's important to know that you should always stand up for what's right, even if you're standing alone. But guys, you're not alone. Like most of us want to jump in and help. Like that's our natural instinct. So you're not gonna be standing alone if you jump in and try to shut down bullying, especially if it's in person in a big crowded hallway. You know, you standing up and saying, hey, that's not cool. is gonna make 10 other people turn around and they're probably on your side where, hey, that's not cool. We should also shut it down. You're not yeah. alone, you're not a tattle. You, you've got bystander power and you can step in. Yeah. And this one is, is that I think it, we, if we could tell the kids, if they do it once, then it's, it's like bad behavior too. The next time isn't so bad stepping in when you realize the first time wasn't that bad. So yeah, helps you gain confidence. So practicing at it at home with your parent or practicing it in the classroom with peers and teachers, it's, it's great to just rehearse it and feel confident yeah. in what you're going to say. 
Plus it makes you feel, it really makes you feel good that you were able to come to the aid of someone and to assist them. And it, and it really inspires you to be that person that want to assist and aid whenever you see um, poor behavior, danger, whatever, you know, yeah. it makes you want to be that person. Mm. You can make Definitely it more gratifying, right? To be the good guy coming absolutely. in. Absolutely. You know, I mean, because you, you always have to think if it were me, I would want someone to reach out and help me. And so you be that person, you be that, you know, that bridge. Yeah, I think it's almost like volunteering at a, um, maybe at a homeless shelter, you know, gives that, that individual power, um, um, feel good, they can make a difference. They're giving something back to the community, keeping yeah, something safe. Yeah, you're, you're helping the target, you're helping yourself, you know, with your skills. And you yeah. might even be helping the bully because you could help them recover from these, these behaviors by pointing out that it is wrong. You know, they okay. might be seeing yeah. it like, uh, like it was said earlier that they see it all day at home, you know, and they think it's totally normal to treat people like that. Absolutely. But you coming in and saying that it's not normal and you're not going to accept it can actually help the bully recover. Absolutely. E either way it go, whether the bully was the victim and is acting out his victimization or whether the bully is just a cruel person, either way it goes, they still get the message that, you know, this isn't cool. Maybe you ought to think about changing your behavior and, and acting a different way, you know, because now they're not in power. No. Now they've been removed from that, you know, pedestal. Center. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because and they're so, seeking control and power and popularity. Also, and if you take exactly. that away- They are also seeking acceptance and popularity from the crowd. And so the more the crowd supports and eggs them on, the more they do it. But if they find that the crowd is not in support of their actions and behavior, then it, it, it really does go away quickly, you know? And they learn that they could- have friends without being mean to people exactly yeah awesome yeah great discussion i'm so glad that i kept it short today and we were able to talk it through so. with the few stragglers left on <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right thank you so much i'm i'm out of here i have stuff to do Bye, have an awesome day guys okay bye-bye bye you guys thanks for joining in today and we'll see you on Thursday where we'll be talking about suicide prevention. Do they have a schedule for the other ones coming up? Does everybody have a schedule? Yeah. Yes, they will. Good. It was publicized. <laughs> now, whether you opened your email, <laughs> that's a different story. <laughs> yeah. Yep. We all end up doing that sometimes. <laughs> oh my goodness. There was, um, recently I, cause I'll read your subject title and based on your subject title will determine whether or not I open it up. Go deeper. <laughs> oh my God. You know? And I'm like, stop, you have to stop doing that. You know, cause sometimes there's, you know, a vital piece that isn't captured in the subject. And so then you wind up, you know, missing something important. Absolutely. You know, so I'm like, Okay, I got to stop this. <laughs> but great presentation as usual. Oh, thank you guys. I'm so glad the discussion was able to come out of it. We had uh, 32 today. Yeah, and the most in, in the moment interaction, which I thought was really great. Yeah, very much so, very much so. You know, 32 all staff? There were 32 people. One was a student that clicked out early. I was disappointed in that. I'm like, dang, you should stay. Cause this is, again, it's empowerment for both the victim and the bully, you know? Awesome. All right. I will see you Thursday, you guys. Thanks so much.
Have yeah. a great day. Have a good right, one. Tony. Bye now. Bye.